Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. I have the pleasure of bringing return guest Eric Shaw to the channel. Eric is the author of Sacred Thread, a comprehensive yoga timeline, 2000 events that shape yoga history. During this conversation, I have a chance to pick some different events that have happened along this long, deep history in yoga. And there's so much that scratching the surface would actually probably be exaggerating what we get to do here. So my, what I really enjoy about speaking with Eric is he is, has been studying for a really long time. He's got a good grasp on the yoga history and he's pretty open to exploring all the different ideas and options surrounding it. I hope that you enjoy this. If, if what we talk about does push any buttons, I feel really comfortable that my heart is in the right place. I just want to explore and I want to learn and I want to hear about different ideas and just, you know, let, let the dust settle if something, you know, is f- triggers me. And if you feel the same way, wonderful. If, if I do push or he pushes your buttons, um, you can reach out to us and let us know. You can reach me on my email info at nativeyogacenter.com. Um, you can check out, I'll have the link for Eric's book in the comments below or the, the, uh, description below. All right. So on that note, uh, let's get started here. All right. Thanks. Let's go. Welcome. I'm so happy to have Eric Shaw here with me today on the podcast. Eric, you are a return guest and I'm so excited to have another opportunity here to, ask you some more questions surrounding the authorship of your book, uh, which I'm showing here for those of you watching on YouTube, for those of you that are listening, it's called Sacred Thread, a comprehensive yoga timeline, 2000 events that shaped yoga history by Eric Shaw. And he's here with me now. And on that note, if you're interested in the book, the link to purchase it on Amazon is in the notes below. So it should be really easy for you. And Eric, what I really love about your book is that it it gives me, well, at least for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to read a couple of the events out of the timeline and see if you can expound a little bit, because I know you have extensive time in the saddle of research and study here in yoga philosophy. But before yeah. we, before we jump in... How are you? How are, I, I, something that I've forgotten. <laughs> in case there's something you've forgotten. Well, let's just build into the okay. equation that that's okay. It's okay to make a mistake and it's okay to forget something every now and again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm amazed at how much I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> right? I guess this is a good way to keep your brain sharp, right? Just like yeah, ra- yeah, yeah, random yeah. quotes out of the book and then um, put you on the spot to see. Yeah, yeah. I, I like thinking on my feet, so that's no, fine. Excellent. Um, the first one that I wanted to bring up is on page four at the timeline of 500. So we're in the beginnings, the pre-common era. Yeah, yeah. Actually, before we even start, can you just explain what the pre-common era, what does that mean? Like if I'm brand new to yoga philosophy, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. So, I mean, knowledge is always advancing and it advances in the humanities as well as everywhere else. Uh, and so the way we look at history in every discipline, not just yoga, but every you know discipline, you know, French history, American history, the, the history of the industrial age, whatever. Um, we've tried to step away from sectarian designations. And it might be strange for someone in the Western world to think about uh, the designation AD. Um, or BC as sectarian designations, but in fact they are because they're dated from the birth of Christ, who is a religious figure. Um, So in an attempt to secularize that, 
um, we now we still use the term um, BCE before Common Era. So this idea that the world shared something, you know, through I guess the breadth of the Roman Empire, but even that's kind of a specious spe suggestion. Uh, that we have, we share a common era to the birth of Christ. It's still pegged to the birth of Christ, of course, but we don't call it, um, you know, Annus Domini AD um, or, um, you know, before Christ BC. Um, we say before common era or common era. So CE is common era, BCE, and it's the same yearly designations, but it's it's secularized. It's it's non sectarian now. Thank you for clarifying that. In relation to yoga history, if we say BCE before Common Era, what is the what is one of the pivotal historical moments in yoga at that zero CE, zero Common Era? Is there something that's in the yoga world that's a, a significant event? that is dated around about the birth of Christ or at the beginning of the CE, the common era? Yeah. Um, if you're going to hit that pretty much on the nose, you're probably going to think about Maitri Upanishad or, uh, or the Brahma Sutras, which were, you know, and all these dates are quite speculative, you know, because we didn't, you know, we didn't publish codexes or books in that period with a copyright date. <laughs> so point. we just, we date them according to the nature of the language, to the nature of other texts in that period, which might've referenced that text before or after, or texts which dealt with similar themes. And so we can kind of see like, oh, they were thinking about this in the, this point of history, or we know that this, it, sometimes you're lucky, like sometimes it'll name an astrological event. I mean, that's the most specific thing. Mm. And then we can pinpoint it. Um, or it'll name some historical ruler or kingdom or something, and then we can pinpoint it more easily too. But Brahma Sutras and Maitri Upanishad. Maitri Upanishad is one of the later Upanishads, and um, it deals with certain conversations, if I remember correctly, <laughs> around um, actually Maitri Upanishad. Now I'm, I'm mixing it up with another one. Um, it's one of the the group of texts that we call the Upanishads, which first came out around the time of the Buddha, the first uh, early Upanishads, Chandogya Upanishad and whatnot, Abrahad Aranyika Upanishad, around 500 years before the birth of Christ. But then we get a series of these important books, which are discussing yoga, which are discussing the laws of karma, which are discussing in some suggestive way the nature of the subtle body and how it operates. And so some of those later Upanishads kind of get pushed into the common era. Um, and Maitri Upanishad is one of them. Um, and then the Brahma Sutras is an important text, mainly in terms of the philosophy of the Advaita Vedanta, non-dualist uh, approaches to understanding the nature of reality, which really emerges in the seventh century of the common era. But Shankaracharya, the chief teacher of that tradition, designated uh, the Brahma Sutras as one of the key texts of his traditions, the Priyaya, Priyay Tantri, Priya, Priya, Priyantrayi, a group of three texts which are important to him, Bhagavad Gita being one of them as well, um, which commented on the Upanishads and put them into a certain category of thinking, which made them what we call non-dual, this idea that there is only one way of knowing reality, and that's to know it with absolute clarity. And if you don't know it that way, everything else is maya, everything else is illusion. It's a very strict binary, even though it calls itself non-dual, it has a very dualistic approach to the understanding epistemology, the way of knowing. Um, so Brahma Sutras was composed around that time. Um, the other thing that we might look to is the uh, um, emergence of the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutras, which comes close to that time. Like in the next 200 years, it's kind of the earliest dating period, Yoga Sutras is produced. If you, you know, depending on who you depend on as an authority in the designation time-wise, and uh, the Bhagavad Gita are produced, which are kind of the two arms of the yoga tradition, the Brahma, the um, Bhagavad Gita kind of being the householder tradition that kind of takes the yogi path and integrates it into a understanding of duty within the life of the householder. 
And then, of course, Yoga Sutras, which is actually, even though it's been translated in a lot, or rather, I should say, interpreted in a householder tradition, the modern householder tradition, it is really, if we, you know, pay attention to the actual words on the page, it is a strict yogi tradition. It's for the brahmachari. It's for the yogi who is living a celibate lifestyle. Um, so those two texts, which are keenly important to our modern yoga tradition, yoga sutras more so, of course, um, get produced near that time. Mm. Great answer. Thank you so much. And I've I've read, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there's three, the three major or main religions in India is Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, you could say that. And I noticed on page four at 500 uh, pre-common era, it says circa date for the life of the Buddha and also circa date for the life of Mahavira, the founder of Jainism. What type of coincidence or not do you think it is that both of Buddhism and Jainism were born or flourishing or coming into existence at the same time? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, we, we kind of had a preview of this conversation in our last aborted attempt to make this uh, podcast go. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, and it's a really, a, I think it's a key concept. I'm glad you asked me that because it's really a key concept for, I think, understanding the nature of modern yoga. And that is that um, what was happening in that period, which gave rise to some alternative philosophies, which really impacted the Brahmanic tradition, the tradition of priesthood, which rested its authority in the Vedas and the message of the Vedas, was starting to erode. It was starting to lose influence. It was starting to be practiced by fewer people because it was less adaptable to the situation on the ground. And the situation on the ground was an arising of what we call the second urbanization in Indian history. The first urbanization goes back 3,300 years before the birth of Christ to the Indus Sarasvati civilization, which is in northern India around where we, Pakistan is today. A profoundly developed urban culture, one of the earliest urban cultures in human history, you know, with Samaria, Mesopotamia, and, and Egypt and whatnot, contemporaneous with those, and a very complex culture, richly complex, and which was a cultural feeding stream to modern Hinduism and or even the Hinduism of, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. But that culture declined partly probably because of happenings in the biosphere, changing of drying up of rivers and whatnot. Um, but then we get a second urbanization that is contemporaneous with what we call the axial age across human history. Generally, there were events that were in which we got civilizations in North and South America, in China, uh, in the, you know, the, the Greek islands. Um, and this is a time when urban culture was arising worldwide in key cultures. And so we as human beings had a very different experience of self. We had a very different experience of the uh, relationship to the primal experience of the seasons, uh, a different experience to daily living and how we support ourselves and our sense of what we might call praxis, what we do in this life and how we think about it. And to put that quite bluntly, what we do in our jobs. Um, and so to live in an urban culture, as we all know, we encounter strangers every day and we encounter strangers we don't know. And we encounter strange people that we don't understand. And so this kind of monolithic understanding of, of the Brahmanic tradition, the Vedic tradition, which is very tribal. We know the truth. This is our truth. Those barbarians over there don't got it. We're lucky to have it. <laughs> a very kind of us them approach to reality, even though it had a very universal cosmology, which seemed to include a lot of understanding, gets shifted into this idea of karma, mm -hmm. which is broadly applicable, applicable to every human experience and integrates the other, those weirdos over there, those barbarians over there who have a different way of living that we don't understand, integrates their understanding too, 
And so with this urban culture where we're thinking more about identity, I'm a blacksmith, you're a king's attendant, you're a milkmaid, you are, you know, you are um, a farrier, you are whatever. This idea of seeing people in terms of what our roles are and getting a more discreet, more egoic identity, which creates misunderstanding when we're blended in nature, when we don't have a sense of self. We are the stars, we are the gods, we are the animals, animistic understanding that we see in all the older traditions. That is starting to fade, and we're getting isolated in our own egoic understanding because we see other egos in the urban space and lots of other reasons. Um, we need a new philosophy to deal with that. Mm. Buddha gives us a new philosophy. Yeah. Uh, chief gurus of the standing Brahmanic tradition, which we would eventually call the Hindu tradition give us understandings through these books of the Upanishads and their leadership. And then Mahavira evolves his understanding and how the thing that kind of ties these, these groups of new philosophies together is the base admission that karma is operative in the world. Mm. Yeah. And so all these philosophies don't deny that part of the worldview. In fact, they build on it. And some of them build on it in more extreme ways than others. Jainism is very extreme. Buddhism, a little bit more in the middle. Hinduism, still more like Mahayana Buddhism, kind of everything's okay. We'll just figure out a way to make it go towards God. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been able to read a little bit about Jainism. What is it? What is it that, for those that are listening, that are hearing this for the first time, what are some of the characteristics of the Jain culture? And I'm, I'm also aware that say, if we're studying something and we're outside of that world, that things might look really strange and bizarre. But if we were born into that culture and have that sort of upbringing, it's not really all that bizarre. It's very normal and natural. But I know from a Western perspective, looking at the Jain culture and some of the traditions, it seems so different to what we're used to here. What are some examples of that, that, that you feel comfortable explaining or talking about? Yeah. So, um, every, every tradition evolves and every potent tradition begins, I would suggest with a very extremist view of reality. So we can, you know, think about maybe Bolshevism, <laughs> you know, early communism in Russia, mm. a very extreme view of the nature of materialism and industrial processes and the nature of human beings that they could live in a way that you give all according to one and from one according to all according to whatever your gifts were, you know, a, a, a very strict view of the human personality, how it functions in the world. And then it softens and then it adapts to reality. Reality presses in new temporal experiences arise and the religion becomes more expansive, more inclusive. Of course, the common experience for those of you who have any religious education, or we think about, you know, the Western tr tradition, you think about Christianity, very extreme, 12 disciples following Christ, but eventually, you know, Peter has a dream and says that everybody can be a part of this, this movement, even non-Jews. Um, and so it starts to expand and include Gentiles and more Roman citizens in it. It dilutes itself. So true with Buddhism and Jainism as well. Jainism, as I said, more at the extreme end of the spectrum in terms of um, practice, in terms of attempting to take the laws of karma very seriously. <laughs> and so we get... We get this um, understanding that you cannot harm anything or you're going to get some more karma and you're not going to dissolve into the ultimate at the end of this lifetime. So you're going to live a crazy extreme life where you're going to be a Degumbra. You're not even going to wear any clothes. You're going to expose yourself to nature's forces. You're not going to eat anything but what falls from a tree, like a nut or a fruit. You're going to carry a little whisk with you as you walk to sweep the path in front of you so you don't by chance kill any bugs because that's going to cause you some karma. It's going to make you maybe maybe make you stick around for another lifetime. So this is Jainism in its purest form. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. the laws of karma are sparing down us and we, we're going to work really hard to avoid them. Yeah. Mm, good point. And, uh, but of course, Jainism shifts. It develops a householder wing. And today, Jainism is still extant in the Indian subcontinent, not really extant in a lot of other places in the world, but it has, they're known as very good business people. There, mm-hmm. It's kind of in, interesting that they went from that to what they are today. They're known sort of the way Jewish people are known today as people that are very successful in business, very disciplined. Um, they abide by a lot of the same, you know, cultural rules of Hindus in India where, you know, you have arranged marriages and whatnot. But Chinese, you know, had a very extreme root and then it evolved into something more adaptive. And along that way, it actually, you know, over those many thousands of years, it, it integrated certain forms of yoga. And there's certain scholars that follow that, like Christopher Chapel. But um, that's kind of its big sketch. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. That, that brings a little bit of, a little bit of light to it. I remember hearing, um, similar to what you said about catching the fruit after it had fallen on the ground and ideas about like not walking around during monsoon season because of the potential for stepping in a puddle and, Mm. and killing an organism in the puddle or, and, um, that seems so different to consumer consumerism America where it's, mm. there's sometimes this thought of like, who cares if we dredge oil up and cut down every tree? Yeah. It's a never ending resource that will forever be renewable and remade yeah. and, and renewed. So it seems like a very, a completely different philosophy. Would you agree with me on that? Or do you, do you see similarities between these two different ideas? Well, they really didn't have an environmentalist ethic in that regard. Mm. And it wasn't being done for that purpose. It was much more existential regard. What's going to happen to me and this Atman, this particular yeah. soul that's trapped within this body? That's the driving, you know, force behind the action. Um, it's interesting to interpret it as you have, and and that's valid, you know, to look at history and see how it can inform our present understanding. Um, it would be, of course, be inappropriate to put that understanding on that time period. Yeah. But um, in light of how we view our response to nature now that's an interesting perspective yeah much much more respect um for ahimsa right for what killing means and what killing does great point eric i want to jump into another time period in history this is coming off of page 31 but we're still in the pre-common era and it's 1583, Italian merchant and humanist F. Sassetti travels in India, in parentheses, until 1588, and he makes the first Western reference to Sanskrit in a letter home and notes some lexical correspondences to Italian. Is this the f- one of the first times that's recorded that a Westerner acknowledges or becomes aware of the Sanskrit language? Um, It may be for a Westerner. Um, I'd have to do deeper research to answer that more accurately. Um, And the reason I put that detail in there is that in a way that's a precursor to what would happen in the later 1700s with the Royal Asiatic Society um, where there would be a deep investigations into Sanskrit and an understanding that it had a not just a lexical relationship, a linguistic relationship to Western culture, but also had other cultural relationships in which yoga really kind of gets its founding in terms of the East-West conversation in that period of what we call the Orientalists uh, investigation, the scholars of the late 1700s, early 1800s, when they start to learn the Sanskrit language from the Indian people and start to understand the immense breadth of uh, transcendental understanding that is in the Indian tradition, you know, so, so, so far beyond anything we find in the Western traditions and, and developing a great respect for that and mm. a capacity for translating that into Western audiences. Mm. So Sassetti is... You know, one of these guys, I think he was a Franciscan. Um, you know, the Franciscans were sent into India and they 
had an attitude of a lot of respect for the cultures that they were sent to, you know, Native American cultures, cultures in in Asia, you know, China and, and Japan. They were seeing them, you know, to, to get people to become Christians, but it, it wasn't so blind or, you know, blunt as we often associate with those early missionaries. I mean, they had a lot of respect for these cultures. They had a lot of respect for their own culture. They thought Jesus was the light of the world. And so they wanted to find a way to kind of find it a detente. Like, well, how do we translate the Bible into Navajo? <laughs> how do I translate it into Sanskrit? So that these people can see what I think is so valuable. Mm. Yeah. There was a lot of respect in these traditions. So they looked at these traditions with real seriousness and they were serious scholars. Interesting. Can you explain when we hear that Sanskrit's uh, Indo-European language, if the, if the Sanskrit language was born <clears throat> thousands of years before Europeans had contact with India, how does it get that designation of being an Indo-European language? Does that mean that at some point, the first time a European came in contact with the Sanskrit mm-hmm. language that that's when the Romance languages that have Sanskrit as, as its root started to be developed. Can you, do you understand that or how, what that? Yeah. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you're, you're right. Yeah. So one thing that um, Sir William Jones and these other figures from that were prominent in the, the British incursion into India were doing as scholars was that they were kind of unwinding Indian history at the same time that they were working with ethnography, looking at the evolution of their culture. They were looking at philology. They were looking at the the textual history and they were linguists. They were looking at language very carefully. And these, these guys were brilliant. I mean, crazy brilliant. I mean, you look at their production, the books they wrote and the range of their understanding. It's just awe-inspiring. So very impressive figures with a lot of uh, scholarly acumen. So, um, so what, what the picture that emerged then, which is pretty much still true, uh, it's, it's changed in its details, and there's arguments kind of from nationalistic Hinduism now, which are kind of biased scholarly treatises of the material. But in the Caucasus region, which is kind of what we call Anatolia or northern, or what's Georgia today, or northern Tur- north eastern Turkey, there was a, a culture... Caucasoid culture, these these culture of these guys who supposedly first um, first brought horses to heal, domesticated horses, and lived on the plains and traveled over that area. I mean, today Ukraine's at war, and we know it's kind of the breadbasket of the world. It's that way because that whole area is sort of like the middle of the United States. Mm. Not a lot of mountains, yeah. a lot of open fields. Yeah. You can travel long distances without much interference, and so the horse is very useful for that. Yeah. So these people became quite dominant militaristically, and in this culture that I named earlier, where we actually have the first hints of yoga, the old indo Sarasvati culture in what's today Pakistan, the first urbanization that I mentioned, it was kind of corrupted, interfered with by these tribal nomads. And, you know, at first we thought, oh, it was like the way that the Visigoths conquered Rome. They just came in in a wave and knocked out this, you know, urban culture. But the modern understanding is it took place. It was kind of a blending of cultures. Sometimes conquest is involved, but mm. eventually those two cultures merged, and that language grouping that we call Old Indo-European or by its old name Aryan, which of course is now a problematic term because of what the Nazis did with it, um, is a cultural a set of cultural norms and references as well as a language grouping from which we can trace a lot of european languages mainly latin and find um root words with root references that are the same so one way in which we can explore the deep history of human civilization human culture and its evolution is through language patterns. We can map them through time. Um, There's so many clues in the modern lexicon of all the languages. So 
that's when we refer to old Indo-European and we tie it to Latin, mm. we're not only mapping um, connections linguistically, we're connect, we're mapping connections genetically, mm. we're ma- mapping connections um, culturally, we're mapping connections in historical events. Uh, so that's a fascinating kind of cathexis, a fascinating kind of mix of that is. different discipline understanding in a different disciplines in the historical record which tie us to india and ultimately to yoga and helps us understand yoga better that's so cool i that was a great answer i've always i've been wondering about that that makes perfect sense yeah so those those people in anatolia they didn't just go to the south and to the east into india they also went south into iran Mm -hmm. and they went to the west into europe so that they were just a powerful culture. And there's some of these powerful cultures just influence a lot of different cultures. You know, the Vikings were like that. Um, so we see traces, huge traces of their effect in a lot of traditions. Yeah. Very cool. Let me bring us a little further along into the 1800s. So I'm on page 46 in the 1830s, which I'm, I, I, this might, I guess I, I'm always trying to learn about history and get some sort of like context. And I've recently engaged in watching, I know it's like really trendy and all, but Yellowstone. And then they, I'd love to see more of that. It's and then what they, I've seen. It's like a, <laughs> And then they go back into 1883, kind of show this evolution of how the Yellowstone Ranch from this particular show happened. And then, you know, 1924, and just to kind of try to understand just even the history within the 100 or 200 years here in the U.S. and like how much has changed and how fast and it it amazes me. So even to, to kind of have that visual of like where the American West was at in the 1800s and to, to think, you know, like to read some of the stuff about yoga is pretty amazing. <laughs> like, yeah. Just and a, that was part of the, the goal of my book is I wanted to map it across. Like mm. what was happening in America this time? This, yeah. This was going on in India. It's just, in a way it's very disjunctive. Like to think about these co-evolutionary paths India and the United States or India and the world yeah. and all these events that we tie to yoga. What was going on over here? Well, in 1883, they had, if I'm about right, if I'm thinking about right, that's about the time that they translated the Siva Samhita, mm. you know, which is one of the effects of yoga, you know, and so we can think about that going on with the um, Theosophical Society, you know, investigating India and its traditions and translating original yoga texts. Meanwhile, Yellowstone Park was being developed by a bunch of ranchers and maybe they were still fighting the Indians. And yeah. we had, you know, it's just, yeah. it's strangely disjunctive and, and I think fascinating. It's, it's lovely. It's a lovely. It is fascinating. One, one of the ones I noticed, um, well, yeah, you had just mentioned this one. Well, in 1831, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Blavatsky who was the founder of the Theosophical Society that I just mentioned. Yeah. Is born in Ukraine. August yeah. 12th, 1890. Can you talk to us a little bit about the Theosophical Society and what role that had in helping the West understand India? Yeah, yeah. Massive, massive effect. So a really wonderful subject and something that, you know, I think any view of yoga history would integrate a deep understanding of the Theosophical Society. It's it's hard to think of it now, but what what could I compare it to? Hard to compare it to any other cultural movement that's going on today. Um, maybe I could think about, I don't know. Well, anyway, I mean, a lot of artists were involved in it. A lot of scholars were involved in it. A lot of, you know, people who were key cultural movers. If you were a cool person in the, from about, 1875 is when it was founded. <laughs> if you're um, a cool person. <laughs> but yeah, if yeah. you were a cool person, if you were a c- cultural creative, you know, Henry Steele Alcott and Petrovna Blavatsky and William Kwan Judge and a bunch of other guys founded it in America in 1875. 
And uh, it becomes this world society where all the artists and educators and religionists, cool people who are doing cool things that are kind of on the cutting edge. And you really start to get kind of modern avant-garde society and every kind of cult level of culture production around that time. They were theosophists. They were people who believed in the perennial philosophy, this idea that every world religion or knowledge system is aimed towards the same source. It's not a bunch of bricolage. It's not a bunch of competing philosophies. They all are trying to describe mm. the same reality. Mm. So we got that in, in this really cool philosophy of, of, um, of, the, of the Theosophical Society. And it blended powerful elements of yoga, um, primarily, but different understandings from Buddhism, different understandings from actually old Egyptian traditions, because that was big. Um, and Blavatsky was a really weird character who was unique for her time. She, she was a woman who had traveled around the world, you know, technically Russian. U Ukraine was a part of Russia at that point in time in history, if I remember correctly, but she identified as Russian and she had a very rich husband and, but she divorced from him, but she had all his, all of his money. So she could travel around the planet having very unique experiences. Yeah. And so, the way I described Blavatsky, she's been called kind of a faker, is that she was, you know, this thing that we say, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Mm. She didn't know as much as she said she knew, but she knew more than everybody else around her. Mm. So she was able to kind of weave this understanding of East and West, the conversation between East and West. And she was so charismatic and so self-motivated and so full of her vision of how the East and West could have a deeper conversation that she empowered publishing houses and organizations. And in, when we look at yoga with the Theosophical Society, it's not just all these other things that I mentioned, but they translated all the key yoga texts of that era you know, into English, you mm. know, they translated the Yoga Sutras, they translated the Siva Samhita, they translated the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, they translated the Garanda Samhita, and they, they, not just one edition, but numbers of editions with different commentaries. And so, and they, 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 they taught the chakra system in their classes. I remember when I was a young man, first gravitating towards some of this weird alternative stuff, going to a theosophical class in Portland, Oregon, I must've been like 19, like just, I'd stopped out of college for a while. And they were teaching us about the chakra system. <laughs> I didn't know it had anything to do with yoga at the time. Yeah, yeah. But so it was a deep, uh, deeply rooted in Western culture form that was teaching the synergy, the interrelationship of East and West. And yoga was a key part of that. So the, the society that Tr Petrovna Blavatsky founded had a huge effect on the east west conversation wow <laughs> is there a current group that are pushing the boundaries on the level that you're noticing that the theosophical society did you, you tried to think of a group a current yeah. group isn't there a group that's pushing the boundaries with the whole hatha yoga project or why do I think there's something called the something project? <laughs> oh gosh, that's a yeah. horrible way to come in with a question. <laughs> yeah, I just remember hearing something recently where there's uh, there are more modern scholars that are attempting to sounds like do what the, the Theosophical Society was doing during that time, but nothing jumped into your mind as to be equivalent. Is there anything that comes yeah. close? Um. In relation to the yoga philosophy, well, no, you, you. Know, you know, I mean, I know okay. what you're doing with your book. I know you're probably wanting to say, well, that's what I'm trying to do with my book. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. I, I mean, the East-West conversation is still very, very dynamic um, because the cultures continue to diverge in their different ways and meet in different ways. Yeah. Um, actually, the, the example I was that I couldn't call to mind, and I know which is kind of a contentious one because people have strong opinions about it, is Scientology. Mm. I mean, it's kind of a unique kind of you might say a pseudo religion and theosophy was kind of a pseudo religion ah. uh, that a lot of culture creatives are a part of. And it's very dynamic for their 
sense of themselves and their sense of the world and how productive they get. I mean, I'm not a Scientologist and I, I just have a peripheral understanding of it, but you know, a lot of prominent people in the entertainment industry are Scientologists. So that's, that was my nearest correlative. That oh, I could think of. Yeah. That's a good one. That got my, that got me thinking. That's cool. Yeah. I, yeah, I know. And I want to just tiptoe to be careful because I want to respect everybody's belief system. So I don't want to say anything negative about Scientology. I guess I, I've seen a lot of negative stuff about Scientology. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah, I get some bad press. But every religion gets a lot of bad press these days. But it, <laughs> Even yoga. <laughs> Even yoga gets bad press, huh? <laughs> Even yoga. That's cool, man. I hear you. I guess, but I like the idea of thinking about to be a spiritual person in the, in a secular world. Yeah. Yeah. Any kind of spiritual person. I mean, yeah. That's interesting. Good point. Good point. Um, sorry. I, I was trying to get ahead. So I would have a question ready for you to go, but But, I do have, it might be interesting to riff off your, your tangent, which you were kind of (laughs) referencing the Hatha Yoga project. So that was something that if I got the dates right, was, uh, initiated in 218 with Jim Mallinson and, and um, Mark Singleton and a bunch of other people who applied for a huge grant to the European Research Council and got like five million dollars to research y- Hatha Yoga texts. And Mallinson was the you know the uh, key. He was the guy who applied for the grant yeah. and was able to distribute it and hold in Balakwava and, and Singleton and some of the other people, Jason Birch and some other people. And they they. I think that they just finished it in two, 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 2000 this year, if I remember correctly, and they did made huge contributions to our understanding of the historical timeline and the text of Hatha Yoga, because they mainly focused on that medieval period beginning in about the year 1000, uh, where the key texts were produced. So the Hatha Yoga Project was in a broad movement that incorporated a lot of people, but it was a very, very powerful research initiative which vastly expanded our understanding of particularly yoga history, but also yoga texts and the roots of Hatha yoga. Mm. So Jim Allenson, shout out to him. And especially, I mean, put him in a, a, a YouTube search and listen to his talks. They're, they're amazing. The, right. Yeah. Cool. Good advice. If I jump <laughs> forward to this one caught my eye, 1927, and I've heard this name before, but I have no visual representation of this. And I'm wondering, I do want to lead this into the picture that you put on the front of the book. So I'm curious, but it says, um, Richard Hittleman, TV yogi, founder of studios and author of 24 books on yoga philosophy and practice is born in New York City, March 7th of, of uh, this is in 1927. Who is he? Richard Hillman, yeah, I think. Like... character. Uh, we're kind of near his birthday, aren't we? <laughs> we are. March 7th. March 7th, pretty close. Yeah, we could pay a little tribute yeah. to him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the thing about Hittleman and the reason he was kind of forgotten is that unlike Iyengar, unlike Kavitavi Joyce, unlike, uh, you know, uh, John Friend or any, or, you know, these kind of gurus that emerged strongly in the 90s or as early as the 70s, or the 60s even, is that he really didn't train disciples and produce a kind of group philosophy that left followers. So he's kind of a just a node in history. You know, he's, he's kind of like the Theosophical Society in that way, and that he's largely forgotten. But he was kind of the, you might say, the marquee celebrity yogi in the 60s. Mm started being active in the 50s and supposedly you know, different stories for, you know, very, I mean, um, you know, some people say he went to visit Ramana Maharshi in India, though I think that's just a story that was produced for the reporters. The other story is that he had a Hindu gardener <laughs> in his, uh, that worked for his parents in upstate New York and he taught him yoga and he was, you know, just on from there. He, he kind of did a lot of kind of, didacticism, personal didacticism, and learned a lot. And again, he was in the land of the blind. He was the one eyed, the one eyed man is king. He knew more than most people. And his books are actually pretty good, uh, pretty clear, pretty consumable. Um, and uh, so he, he published albums and stuff about yoga and tons of books. He'd come out with a book almost every two years. 
um, on some aspect of yoga. And a lot of it was rehashing the material that had already written in other books. But, you know, these were all bestsellers. And as the countercultural emerged in the early 60s, you know, they sold even better. Mm. And he, you know, he founded yoga centers based in Santa Cruz, California for a while, which is where I went to school, which is interesting. Um, uh, and he kind of died in obscurity. You know, he he had his cultural moment where he was well known and popular and the sands of time have kind of dissolved him into the firmament, as it were. <laughs> but uh, uh, he was a key figure for a while. He had his day. <laughs> That's cool. I it made me think though the the picture on your book. Can you tell me yeah. the story behind this picture? Because my wife was checking it out and she was like, yeah. "That's a very interesting picture." Like, isn't it? Who, who is that? Um, I didn't know who it was when I um chose the picture. The picture is just so cool. And actually, I've changed the cover of the book since then. It's a little bit better. The type types a little bit better. Uh huh. Um, and it has my full name, Eric Johnshaw. Um, but, um, that is, uh, sir, what's his name? My name is, his name's escaping me, but it'll come to me before the podcast is over. Hopefully it's okay. Um, he was a British spy and, uh, but he gravitated to, um, Pierre Bernard, the great Ohm in the 1920s, who was uh, also another figure like Hittleman, who was huge in yoga history in his day, but it's kind of been forgotten. Um, the omnipotent Ohm was his name. Um, and um, he learned a lot of yoga from him. He was a British guy. And um, he went back to Britain and became a key figure, both in teaching yoga and as a yoga celebrity. Mm. God, I don't know why his name is escaping me. It's... Um, if I looked in the book around about, you said 1920, if I go. Yeah. Yeah. He starts working on the it, It'll come to me. That's but, okay. uh, uh, he, he was the first yogi to appear on TV, the BBC, um, where he does these kind of these kind of yogic feats on TV uh, with a lot of beautiful women around him and whatnot. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, he was one of these British guys who allowed himself to, kind of uh what they would say go native he uh he with good faith he took in a culture outside of britain and was a key figure in giving it legitimacy and teaching it in his anglo culture um he wrote a number of books on yoga too mm. um and i was kind of excited to this to realize that that was him in that picture oh cool if like yeah, you weren't aware of that yeah. when you first chose it and then you pieced it together. It'll kind of be, I mean, you can, we can search for it. I mean, if you want to look to the 1920s, I, I mean, actually, probably I, in the index. I think what's I, so classic is maybe, have, maybe these two guys here, I mean, yeah. um, you know, arms folded. Yeah. Looking at this guy doing Ardhamatsyandrasana yeah. or yeah. maybe, yeah, it looks like Ardhamatsyandrasana, half, half yeah. floor to the fish pose. And just like, I don't know, just like the thought of these guys just staring at a guy doing yoga going. <laughs> yeah, my guess is that's around, you know, 1936, mm. 1938, mm. you know, just from the fashion and, yeah. you know, it, yeah. yeah, right. I mean, it, and they're not, they're not closed, but they're yeah. kind of halfway open and interested. And yeah, yeah. Finished the, room and the picture does tell a big story, I know. Yeah, yeah. it's the East West. <laughs> yes, I like it. You know, going back just a little bit, but in the chronology, page 95, 1920s, the 37-year-old Krishnamaracharya returns to Bangalore and marries Iyengar's 11-year-old sister, Srimati yeah. Namagiriyama, in yeah, March. Namagiriyama. Child marriage being common practice in the India of that era. So one of yeah. the stories I've kind of heard is, you know, Krishnamaracharya, who is the guru of Patabi Joyce and Iyengar, is in the Himalayas studying yoga, spends about eight years, and then his guru says, go back down and become a family man and yeah. spread the teachings of yoga to the household house or to the grihastha or the householder culture. Yeah. 
I don't know how true that is because I mean a lot of times like I always just hear fish like I always think fish stories in relation to like you know the fish was this big and it's this big and it's this big so I always just wonder like when you hear this little condensed storyline that's been passed down for hundreds of for a lot for many years you wonder like like how true is that really but um, I guess do you have any insight into that the the historical perspective of how Krishnamaracharya what he learned and, and that whole process of becoming like a family man. Yeah. So my bet is that, um, that that was true. Mm -hmm. Um, there can't really be, I don't think a reason for Krishmacharya to tell that story if it wasn't true. I mean, there's no real motivation that we can figure out for it that has much legitimacy. Yeah. And it also just seems, also seems, in character mm-hmm. with a lot of things that were happening in that historical period. So I believe that story. I mean, it's, yeah. it's legendary, but it seems to have appropriate level of veracity. Um, or he wouldn't have done what he'd done because he was, he wasn't the kind of guy that you would think would get married and he got married late in his life. He was 38 years old. I mean, that's unique, very unique for an Indian man of that period. Why mm-hmm. would he do it unless mm-hmm. his guru told him to do, I mean, that's just one line of reasoning. I mean, there's a lot of ways that we could, I think, uh, attribute that to a, a guru's suggestion. What do you think the connection, though, did, it was when he married Iyengar's sister, was Iyengar yep. a student of Krishnamaracharya, or did he marry Iyengar's sister, and that's how Iyengar met Krishnamaracharya? Yeah, the latter. The latter. So, oh, so he... And then you you put in parentheses that this was during that time period in India marrying 11 year old was socially acceptable. I think probably anyone listening in our culture here now would be cringing at the thought of a 30 year old, 38 year old man marrying an 11 year old. Yeah. Do you ever get any insight into that? Or is that just like a taboo subject? Like, let's just not go there. <laughs> oh, I mean, we can talk about it. I mean, yeah, you might get some hate mail, but um. <laughs> no, I, I'm not seeking that out. I just didn't know if there was any you hate mail over just, you know, opening your eyes in the morning these days. So <laughs> good point. Good point. Can't say anything without stirring up controversy, but maybe that's a good thing. People are thinking and responding. True. Yeah. All Feeling right. Strong to express yeah. Yeah. Maybe we we'll just leave that one go then. Um, no, I mean, I'd be glad to talk about it. I'm not, I'm not, a very, I mean, if you are, I don't, I don't know it. that I have too many more questions or that it just makes me a little uncomfortable, I guess, but I guess I, I need, I always just try to look at things from the angle of that different cultures do different things in different yeah. time periods. And so my judgment is yeah, yeah, understand need to gender and how it functions in culture and yeah. uh, kind of the nature of fecundity and, and birth and fertility and, you know, the roles of men and women. And, you know, I mean, there's a way in which all of that in that context can be seen to be a positive thing. Uh, he did not have sexual relationships with her until she was 18. Ah, um, well, that's actually maybe maybe that's helpful. That is helpful. Yeah, all right. Help. <laughs> yeah, and he and he became a householder, which you know, if you if we're going to kind of keep steering this to yoga history, I mean, that kind of allowed him to be in the world yeah. rather than back in a cave or just in a scholar's den. Yeah, uh, teaching people um, and having you know, kind of softening his personality because Krishnachari was a very extreme person, um, and so it was probably good for him to have a wife. And and one thing that I speculate about, I think it's it's in the book, is that you know that that uh, he was such a hothead, he was such an extremist, you know, he's such an intellectual and so focused on like the black and white of the world, things you know being seen in very extreme rational terms, that that uh, his uh, guru needed to slow him down, <laughs> he needed mm. to say, dude, dude, uh, you need a wife, you need some kids, mm. you need to like. You know, just cool it a little bit. Um, I think if this is your path, it will be best for everybody involved. <laughs> You're not going to hurt anyone. Yeah. Uh, but you hurt a lot of people anyway. He was a very severe character. Um, so that's my sense that he wanted to take the edge off of Krishnacharya's ego. And uh, his family had relationships with uh, the family of Iyengar. They were all Sri Vaishnavites. Uh, similar cast, and in those days, you pretty much married somebody in your cast, and so it was seen as an alliance of two families, you know. And Iyengar seemed to have a good family; they had like seven kids, and 
father died soon after that. But I mean, we, we get the benefit of it because he became a householder and yeah, you know, produced you know, powerful sons who contributed to the yoga, Jessica Char and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, he met Iyengar, who became one of the greatest teachers in world history and taught Iyengar. And you have a background in practicing Iyengar yoga. Why? You have a, you have, you've had a lot of, you've had a a lot of experience practicing Iyengar yoga. Yeah. 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 In the past. Yeah. What about these days when you, when you do do any Hatha yoga practice, are you mostly fascinated with the philosophy side? Um, It all comes in. I mean, uh, my training in Iyengar yoga has had an immense effect on me and uh, really internalized my understanding and made me attentive to alignment in ways that are still, still powerful for me and still open up doors for me. And I, I revere my teachers, um, Tony Briggs, Shanda Remite, and a lot of others who taught me amazing things, which, you know, have opened up doors for me to keep exploring. So Iyengar was an amazing teacher, a man of great integrity and ferocity, like his guru. Um, he had his shortcomings like everybody, but he, he offered an incredible gift to the world and we, we still benefit from it. I, I still benefit from it personally. Very cool. I'm because you just mentioned a Sikachar, when I got to page 206 on, in 2013, it says accused of inappropriately having sex with the students. How do I pronounce this name? Kastub? Kastub? Kastub. His son. Kastub. Kastub de Sikachar falls from grace. Is that de Sikachar's son? Yeah. Got it. I didn't know that. That was a new one for me. <laughs> All right. I, I wanted. Uh, yeah, I, want, I wanted to kind of jump as we're getting close to our our one hour session mark here. I wanted to jump a little bit more like into the current modern times. And actually this one, I, I see that you, you're using a bibliography. And on page 223, this is something I wanted to ask you about, uh, about Wendy Doniger. I, for a yoga class recently used her interpretation of the Vedas, I believe it was Rig Veda, that she had done a lot. Uh, I don't know what year she did that in. And then I had someone kind of sharply correct me that she actually this came from an Indian woman that don't listen to Wendy Doniger. She's a Westerner that doesn't, isn't, translating the Vedas according to the true meaning of the Vedas. And I, and I was, I was thankful that I had that insight because I was enjoying reading Wendy's book. And I thought it just really interesting, just getting that interpretation or translation of the Vedas or the Rig Veda. What are your thoughts around all that? Have you heard that before? Is that, is that common knowledge? And I want to be up to speed with what's going on. Do you know I wouldn't say it's common knowledge. <laughs> I guess, and maybe in, in a small little smurf circle of people that are yeah. interested in yoga philosophy. But um, what 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 do we know about all that? Yeah, so let's not call that knowledge. Let's okay. call that an opinion. Okay, right. thank you. All right. Say my interpretation of a text is incorrect. That's an opinion. Okay. And and you know the wider consensus is going to depend on your authority and my authority my experience and your experience right yeah that makes so, sense so if i can map that for you wendy doniger is is an incredibly gifted linguist uh, she came out of the great uh, the gate with an amazing book called shiva uh the erotic ascetic really really transformed our understanding of indian myth and how it evolved and the richness of it that was, I think that was her dissertation, but that was her, her first significant book. And she tied it to modern, postmodern philosophy and everything. I mean, just brilliant. I mean, this woman is just a genius beyond genius. Part of her genius is expressed in her freedom from social norm. Uh, she is not shy about interpreting the erotic elements of Indian tradition, which are key. They're key to the householder tradition and the understanding of fertility in the household, all those 
images we see on the old Indian tipples of people having crazy sexual experiences. That's all a sign of fertility. And then also the way that sex was used in the Hatha yoga tradition to control the movement of energy in singular bodies or in sexual ritual with a, a coupled pair. So, but what India has been gifted by the British incursion, unfortunately, is a shame of those traditions because the British were ashamed of their sexuality, you know, the Victorian era, and they, mm. they put that on the Indians and they took it on. Good point. So that whole tradition that embraced sexuality, which is a part of so many traditions before the Victorian era, um, has been denied. Uh, people aren't comfortable about it because they think it sheds them in a bad, looks them in a bad light. And so because Doniger is so free with this material, mm. You know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, read the text if you want to compare her translation of the Rig Veda with some other person's translation. You can do that. I think she's. My opinion is that she's brilliant and she's straightforward and uh, uh, very poetic and clear in her interpretations. The main reason that she got in a bad way with the Indian public is she wrote a history of Hinduism called The Hindus, and because it, she published it at the time of rising Hindu nationalism in India, and because she was so comfortable with the erotic elements of Hindu history, the book was banned. Mm. The book was not only banned, but all the published editions of the book were shredded because a court case was brought against her for uh, some... So I can't the exact term. I mean, degeneracy or something like that. Okay. And the court case was won because you have you have stronger laws against censorship in India. I've got the book on my shelf. It's an amazing book. It's a brilliant book. You know, it's an idiosyncratic book. I mean, she's comfortable with her idiosyncratic approaches to traditions, but it's brilliant and it's insightful. And there's a lot of truth in it that a lot of Indians are uncomfortable with now because Hindu nationalism is trying to say it's an ideology. And any ideology says all of this is good and it has no bad in it. Mm. An ideology is as opposed to a philosophy. Got it. Right. Yeah. Nazism was an ideology. The yep. Germans are good no matter what. Yeah. Fortune is not kosher to say it, but feminism is an ideology. Women are good no matter what. Men are lousy. You know, uh, we're in a world where ideologies are clashing, right? The right wing has its own ideologies. Christianity has become an ideology, painful ideology. It's hurt a lot of people. So ideologies are problematic. Hindutva, which is the new rising racialistic, religionistic uh, approach to government and cultural consensus in India, is not wanting to look at its history in any kind of open way. What's just it's only good. Hindus are only good. They don't make any mistakes. And that's problematic. So they look at, at Doniger in this light. So back to the yoga tradition, I wanted to get too much off tack. I mean, I think her re rather idiosyncratic, um, got it on my shelf, translation of the uh, Vedas is wonderful to read. It's wonderful to read. And if, and if you don't think Doniger's on point, you know, read some other translations. There's not many out there, frankly which are very approachable because the Vedas are so thick and there's a lot of material that no one will even ever want to read because it's just very technical. But she tells stories. You know, give me half a moment. Yeah, please. I pulled it my shelf. No, it's cool. I, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing that sort of perspective. I think the, uh, the, the concept that you're mentioning about ideology versus philosophy yeah. is really fascinating. I mean, um, so when you put it in this sort of that con that sort of context, I mean, I I usually like to, you know, it also makes me think of say like Salman Rushdie's the Satanic Verses, like yeah. you know that was something that was also banned. Yeah, that's I have that copy. Wonderful book. I, I recommend it to everybody if you want to yeah. investigate the Rig Vedas in a really fun way, colorful way. She chooses the kind of the most colorful myths and stories from the tradition, and she interprets it very freely. And, and you know, she references. Other scholars, you know, she's in the scholarly community. She is massively respected. Got I mean, it. Got her it. general yep. interpretations are not, yeah, not seen as being out of line with the mainstream at all. Okay, so very valuable. And and while I'm at it, you know, I, I mentioned uh, the the Hatha Yoga Project with James Mallison, and this is the primary book they produced. 
the mm. roots of yoga and it's by singleton and mallinson it interprets so many texts from the hatha yoga tradition and cross references okay. them and gives them you know it tells us what different thematically for things that happened in yoga history yeah a really great reference book um that is also you know peer review highly respected uh and it looks at like the medieval tradition from about 1000 to about maybe 1500 and nice. and earlier so nice yeah, a little bit of shout out to other yoga scholars oh man that's amazing eric i mean i <laughs> we could just keep doing these podcast sessions and never even get around to like exhausting ideas that you've already come across. So, you know, for me, this is a real treat to randomly just kind of go across the chronology like that and just pick very uh, like ideas that I never would have heard about or thought about, you know, it's just really, a, it's just a real treat for me. I mean, I love the philosophy world and you've done so much research on this. So I appreciate being open about it and just kind of, you know, like you met, you made mention, maybe we talked about a few subjects that might push people's buttons, but I, yeah. I genuinely get the feeling that you're just trying to keep an open mind and look at all of these different texts and just let me go ahead and read these. I, I really enjoyed on our first conversation that when I asked you then what you, where your beliefs are and you, you know, explained to me that you are a Christian and, and I found that really refreshing too, because maybe sometimes people want to pigeonhole a yoga philosopher. There's, how could he have a specific religion? Because you're coming across so many different ideas. So it seems like the ability to like form your own opinion, but also stay really open to reading all these different scholars' work is just a really important thing that we need in our current culture. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to whitewash myself either. I mean, I have my prejudices and I have my biases, you know, and, and anybody listening to this will be, you know, aware of that. And, and just to correct, I mean, I, I, I'm part of a Hindu Christian group called Yogananda. I definitely claim my Christian, you know, my embrace of Christianity, but I'm also, I feel like I'm a Hindu too. I know that sounds a little bit presumptuous for a person of my ethnicity to say that, but uh, I do feel that truth. So um, yeah, I feel like, we have so much to learn from every culture and the Hindu tradition in particular has a wealth that is just beyond human ken and is so deeply valuable. And the entree that we have into that through yoga is, is amazing that people want to go into the depths. And I, and it, and it hurts my heart that these days yoga has moved to so much of a shallow interpretation in the general practice of the United States. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of speculation about that early on about is it going to go shallow is it going to go deep and it i hate to say it but i think the diagnosis is that it's gone more shallow i mean it's that's painful to me it's like there's so much depth in the tradition and i hope this podcast is um, maybe stimulating to people and will follow up and do their own depth of the practice because it has it serves people so fully thank you eric I think you do an amazing, amazing job, and I, I will hope to have you back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk. Man. And we'll continue, the, talk continue the conversation. And <laughs> so I, you, you, you're really good at what you do. You're so good thanks. at pulling the best out of people, and I, and I value that. So I appreciate, I appreciate you holding the space for me. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. All right, man. Well, I really appreciate that as well. And I, let's do it again. I'll, I'll keep in touch with you. Okay. Cool. Cool. Cool, man. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Native Yoga Toddcast is produced by myself. The theme music is dreamed up by Bryce Allen. If you like this show, let me know. If there's room for improvement, I want to hear that too. We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, Please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review, and join us next time. <laughs>